Oh, class, Professor Mandeville back. I did have one more in me. So uh, today, this next lecture, what we're going to talk about is the rise of cities in America, which will happen during the Gilded Age, but then continue right on into the 20th century. And they'll really become what we consider today as large cities, which really did not exist as we think of them today before the Civil War. So first we want to talk about some population trends that will lead to this tremendous growth in cities in America. Now, uh, the population in the United States is going to grow tremendously in the post-Civil War period. In fact, the U.S. Census performed in 1870 will report that the total population of America in 1870 was approximately 40 million people. 30 years later, the census performed at the turn of the century in 1900 will report that the population since 1870 had doubled to 80 million. Now, that's a pretty short doubling time, as it's known. Uh, scholars who study population talk about doubling times of populations, and 30 years is a relatively short doubling time. Uh, we're lucky that that uh, slowed down, or the population uh, that it would be reported from the 2020 census uh, would have been much higher than it's going to be. They're saying that they're going to report a population of somewhere around, I don't know, 340 million. I don't know, because who knows if the census is going to be accurate or not. Now, at the same time that the population of the entire country is doubling, population of cities will triple during that time period because the census of 1870 reported that approximately 10 million people out of the 40 million lived in what was considered a city in 1870. By the turn of the century, 30 million people, or three times that number, lived in what was considered a city. Now, this was a worldwide trend. And a, one of the main things that caused this was the mechanization of farming, which required far fewer field laborers, combined with the rise of industrialization, which was concentrated in the cities. So you had a situation where people who used to make their livings as a field laborer out in the countryside couldn't have that job anymore, packed up and moved to a city where they could get a job in a factory. Now, this was happening on a large scale in the United States, obviously, with the size of cities tripling in that time period. Now, to give you an idea of this tremendous rise in cities, uh, in 1860, before the Civil War, the United States did not have a single city with a population of one million people. By 1890, we had three cities whose populations exceeded a million. Those cities being New York City, Chicago, and Philadelphia. By the turn of the century, in 1900, we had six cities with more than a million people, and New York City had grown so tremendously, it had a population in 1900 of approximately 3.5 million people, which made it the second largest city in the Western world. The only city larger than New York City in the Western world at the turn of the 20th century was London, which is kind of ironic that we were approaching, uh, surpassing the old mother country. It wasn't that long before that we were the 13 British colonies. So uh, cities will also, especially by the turn of the 20th century, uh, start to take on the look of cities, what we consider cities today. Uh, 
You know, many things will come into being that we take for granted. Uh, for example, uh, in the 1880s, the famous Brooklyn Bridge, a, you know, quite an accomplishment, both architecturally and construction wise, was completed, which was uh, a marvel at its time. And another uh, thing that will take place that sort of gives cities their uh, look, so to speak, will be the advent of the skyscraper. Now, what will cause the skyscraper to come into being is a horrible event that will happen in the city of Chicago in 1871. And that's the Great Fire in Chicago. In 1871, the city of Chicago will basically burn to the ground. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard how this fire took place. I have a lot of relatives in Chicago, and they swear this is the truth. You know, I can't tell you that for sure this is what happened, but you ask anyone from Chicago and they're going to tell you this. The Great Fire in Chicago in 1871 was caused by Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Now, here's how it is supposed to happen here. <clears throat> Back in this day and age, cities still had livestock in them. And you got to remember, up through the turn of the century, the major form of transportation in a city was still horse-drawn. So it was common for people to, at their homes to also have a small barn where they may keep a couple of horses to draw their carriages and so forth. They might keep a cow like Miss O'Leary to have fresh milk, might have a few chickens. This was not uncommon at all. And also, cities had a lot of wooden structures in them. So, as the story goes in 1871, Mrs. O'Leary went out to her small barn to feed her livestock and put them down for the night. And she carried with her, because it was dark, a <clears throat> lantern, probably burning kerosene, some of Rockefeller's kerosene. <coughs> and the cow, when she set it down the ladder, or the lantern to do whatever she was doing, the cow kicked it over, broke it, caused the kerosene to spill out into the barn and catch the barn on fire. Now, that particular day or evening in Chicago was typical for a lot of other days or evenings in Chicago. As most of you know, the nickname of Chicago is the Windy City. They get tremendous winds there, especially coming down out of the north off of Lake Michigan where it sits. Very windy day. This fire started in Mrs. O'Leary's barn, caused a firestorm in the city, and basically burned the thing to the ground. Hundreds died. It was horrible. So, in the aftermath of the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, the city uh, fathers sort of had to go back to the drawing board and figure out what they were going to do. And obviously, one thing they all agreed. We're rebuilding Chicago. By that point, it's at the one end of the Transcontinental Railroad or at the midway point or whatever. But, so, this time, though, they decide to put a little more thought into it because already, even though they didn't call it this, a problem that exists today uh, known as urban sprawl where cities tend to keep growing out was the problem in Chicago. So they decided, why not, let's see if we can have buildings designed where cities grow up instead of out and try to have buildings designed that would be relatively fireproof instead of all these wooden structures. So they hired a local architecture firm in Chicago owned by a great architect by the name of Lewis Sullivan. <coughs> Sullivan and his firm 
will design the world's first skyscraper. Now, the building uh, that they'll design and will be constructed and completed in 1885 will be the home insurance building in the city of Chicago. And it'll be a whopping 10 stories high. Obviously, we have buildings in Platts where I think some of the tower dorms are higher than 10 stories. But when it's the first one, it's the tallest building in the world. So, and the big difference is it's built with an interior steel structure, which is revolutionary. We take this for granted today. When you see skyscrapers being built, they build them with I-beams. Previously, you could only build a building tall, as tall as the masonry foundation would support. Now the weight is distributed throughout the building with this I-beam construction. Revolutionary for its time. Take it for granted today, but somebody had to invent it. So after that, uh, uh, Lewis Sullivan's firm will be hired by cities all across America to design them skyscrapers to be built in their cities, to put them on the map, so to speak. And it's kind of ironic, you know, when you look at old paintings of the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge in 1885 or 86 or whatever it was, the tallest building on the New York sky city horizon was not a skyscraper. It was the steeple of Trinity Church which was 286 feet tall. Now, obviously today, if you stand in Brooklyn and gaze across the East River at Lower Manhattan, or if you stand in Jersey and look across the Hudson, you're not even going to be able to spot Trinity Church because it's surrounded by skyscrapers. Very different time back then. Now, speaking of Sullivan's architecture firm, uh, there was a very famous architect who was just a junior architect at the time working on these projects with Sullivan. And that man's name, who you probably heard of, chances are you hadn't heard of Louis Sullivan, his name was Frank Lloyd Wright, arguably America's most famous architect. He'll break out on his own and become very famous for his designs. And it's kind of ironic because uh, Frank Lloyd Wright tries to incorporate nature into many of his designs, especially his famous prairie homes. He has one design where he actually incorporated an existing creek that runs right through the middle of this home and tries to blend them in with the landscape and countryside, not make them obtrusive like a skyscraper. He also designed the famous Guggenheim Museum and other great structures. <clears throat> so, uh, Sullivan and young Frank Lloyd Wright designed the skyscrapers. Now, something else regarding cities at the time, this is when suburbs will rise up for the first time, and that will be because of Mass transit will start to become a reality. This is the day and age when <clears throat> electric trolley cars come into existence to transport citizens to what were the suburbs at the time uh, in New York City, like the Bronx and Queens, <clears throat> and in other cities. Uh, also during this time period is when electricity will come to America's cities, indoor plumbings, the advent of the telephone, as we talked about Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison earlier, Brooklyn Bridge, completed in 1883. All these things we take for granted uh, uh, regarding cities. Now, <clears throat> another uh, part of the city uh, equation here was... Uh, how people were housed in cities. And uh, not that they were housed in skyscrapers, but during this time period, uh, especially in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, a very popular uh, 
form of construction was the dumbbell tenement building. Now, in your book, I forget what page it's on, but there's a famous painting of the east side on uh, Mulberry Street of Little Italy, which shows a lot of these tenement buildings. Very popular in New York, Chicago, and so forth. <clears throat> these buildings were seven, eight stories high, and they called them dumbbells because they had three segments on each floor that were sort of shaped like a dumbbell. <clears throat> These buildings would be packed with immigrants. We'll be talking later on in our next lecture about immigration, but especially on the Lower East Side in Manhattan, in Little Italy, these dumbbell tenement buildings will be packed with Italian immigrants. And there's no codes for occupancy. So in a two bedroom apartment, three families might live in it. You might have 20 people living in a two bedroom apartment. <clears throat> and these places, unfortunately, were fire traps. They had internal ventilation uh, chambers in the center of them, and if they caught on fire, they went up very quickly. So a lot of people lost their lives in fires in dumbbell tenements because obviously there's no such thing as smoke alarms or anything else. Now, also in many cases... These buildings in the neighborhoods were, I guess, the best way to explain it. Cities in America, in the Gilded Age and the turn of the century, we got one word to explain them. Stinky. They were stinky, filthy, dirty, rotten places to live that no one in their right mind would live in unless they had to. And who were the people stuck packed in the cities at this time? Immigrants, because they had no choice. And we'll talk about the plight of immigrants uh, in our next lecture. Now, the reason why they're so stinky, they're building these tenement buildings as fast as they can. Infrastructure couldn't keep pace with them. So even though they might have indoor plumbing in them, it wasn't hooked up. And even the indoor plumbing left a lot to be desired There'd be two bathrooms per segment on floor. There'd be three segments on each floor, two bathrooms per segment. There'd be six apartments serviced by those two bathrooms down the hall. But it would take a while for the infrastructure to catch up with them, the running water and sewer. So until they were hooked up, which could be a matter of several years, you'd have to construct outhouses out in the alleys behind these dumbbell tenement buildings. <clears throat> now you can imagine what these outhouses smelled like in the middle of the summer. Plus you'd have people, you know, if you're up on the sixth, seventh floor of a dumbbell tenement building, are you gonna run down to the outhouse in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom? People used to use things called chamber pots as portable bathrooms. And a lot of people were lazy, filthy bums. Instead of taking the chamber pot out to the outhouse and getting rid of the contents, they just dump it out the window of their dumbbell tenements. That's why here's a little uh, note that you might not know about. Back in this day and age, when a man and woman were walking down the street, if you were a real gentleman, you were the one who walked closest to the building. You let your female companion, your girlfriend, or your spouse, whatever, or just a female acquaintance, walk on the far outside. Because if somebody dumped their chamber pot out the window, typically then you'd be the one hit with it, not her. Now, <clears throat> if that stink wasn't bad enough, as I mentioned before with Miss O'Leary, everything's horse-drawn. All the carts that deliver everything in a city are drawn around by horses. You look at the old paintings and so forth. A big problem in big cities like New York, Chicago, Philly was horse manure. Hundreds of tons of it would pile up weekly and they couldn't keep pace with it. You couldn't have enough public works workers on the streets with wagons shoveling it 
<clears throat> even after they did remove it from the streets in New York City, guess what they did with it? Dumped it in the East River, which is also where raw sewage poured into. So you can imagine what the East River separating Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn smelled like back in this day and age. So if that stink wasn't bad enough, you also had unregulated factory pollution. <clears throat> the pollution in these cities was horrendous because there was no regulation on what you could spew out a smokestack. And for that matter, there were no restrictions. You know, today smokestacks have to be a certain height in an urban area so that the affluent goes up into the atmosphere quicker, not into your window. And you could pour whatever chemical slop you wanted into the nearest body of water. One thing you got to remind yourselves of, the United States did not have a Clean Air and Clean Water Act or even an Environmental Protection Agency to regulate these things until 1970. So anything went before that. So a combination of human waste, horse waste, and air pollution and water pollution made cities pretty unbearable. I want to read you a couple excerpts of contemporaries talking about this in their time. <clears throat> There's a famous uh, newspaper editor, writer, and author who lived in Baltimore and his name, you may have heard of before, is H.L. Mencken. One summer, Mencken was writing about a really long heat wave that had hit Baltimore. And it was making the city unbearable with the smell of it. And in his article, he wrote, Baltimore smelled like a billion polecats. The stench is something terrible. The stink is enough to knock a person down. Now, let's think about that for a second. A pole cat is a nickname for a skunk. So H.L. Mencken's trying to describe Baltimore in the 1880s, and it didn't smell like one skunk or a dozen skunks. It smelled like a billion, whatever that smells like. And have you ever been around a really horrible smell where when it kind of catches you off guard and you breathe it in, it almost takes the air rate out of your lungs and you can't breathe? That's what it was like in these cities. Now, as far as the pollution goes, one city that was the worst for pollution was Pittsburgh. Andrew Carnegie had all his steel mills there and so forth. <clears throat> now, there's a letter that uh, was uncovered where somebody was writing to a friend of his. He had recently moved to Pittsburgh and he's writing to one of his buddies back on the farm, telling him what it's like there and so forth, and describing what Pittsburgh looked like around 1900. He said, Put Pittsburgh looked and sounded like hell with the lid off. Now, at this point in history, at the turn of the century, in the city limits of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, there were 73 glass factories, 41 iron and steel mills, including Carnegie Steel, and 29 oil refineries. <clears throat> now, Pittsburgh knew they had a problem with air pollution, but they tried to write it off. And in pamphlets encouraging people to move to Pittsburgh, they used to say that uh, the quality of the air in Pittsburgh helped cure lung diseases like tuberculosis. Nobody had any idea what cured tuberculosis, and it certainly wasn't air pollution, but you can make anything up you want, I suppose. <clears throat> they also said you don't have to worry about contracting malaria in Pittsburgh. That's because the water was so polluted, a mosquito couldn't live in it. That's how you get malaria from malaria-bearing mosquitoes. So Pittsburgh was a beauty, to say the least. Now, 
when you've got all these uh, horrible things occurring, trying to live in this unbearable conditions, cram-packed into a dumbbell tenement, you're going to have a lot of social problems. So, one thing uh, that occurred following all this in big cities in the Gilded Age, turn of the century, crime was a big problem. In the 1880s, the murder rate in large cities tripled. The violent place was the cities of the East, not the West, as we see in movies. It was more the wild, wild East because there was absolutely no gun control. Everybody was carrying a concealed weapon and gun fights on the streets in New York City, Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago were routine. <clears throat> Gangs were a big problem, both youth gangs and adult gangs. I don't know if you've ever seen the film Gangs of New York. It's a pretty accurate film, and I'd, I'd advise you to watch it. It's a great film. Uh, suicide rates went through the roof. People couldn't hack it. Immigrants came here with the American dream, and they end up being cram-packed in a stinky dumbbell tenement with people killing each other outside the door. <clears throat> Alcoholism was on the rise. And it's just the time when we start figuring out that it's a disease, not that people are just these doomed drunks who can't be helped. And to sum this up, uh, give you an idea of what a problem alcoholism was uh, in the early 20th century, in 1905, a famous study was done on business in the city of Chicago. They're studying, you know, what's happened in the new century. We've uh, rebuilt after the Great Fire of 1871. So they were curious on business development in Chicago. And in this famous study, they discovered that the number one business in the city of Chicago was bars or taverns. There were as many bars and taverns as grocery stores, meat markets, department stores, and dry goods stores all combined. And one area that still exists in the city of Chicago that's sort of a fallback to this old time is an area in Chicago known as Rush Street. You ever go to Chicago and you go there and you visit people who are from there, no doubt they'll probably take you down to Rush Street. Uh, Chicago's second city isn't too far from there. And it's this massive area, block after block, of nothing but bars. And they're all old and they date back to the turn of the 20th century. So, a lot of social problems were brought on by the rise of these new cities. So, that's all I have in me today. Uh, I'll be talking to you soon uh, to talk to you about immigration and Ellis Island and so forth. So everybody take care. I hope the semester's going good so far. Uh, wear your masks. We'll get through this. We need a vaccine. Take care.